My name is Edinaldo Camargo. I'll be the host this today for today activity. And um, we're going to have two speakers uh, today, Dr. Frank Dayan, Dr. Erin Haramoto. And uh, before we start, I would like to, to mention some, some uh, colleagues that are here present today, Dr. Aldo Miroto. Uh, Aldo is the president of the Brazilian Weed Science Society that is, help, that is uh, uh, helping us providing the Zoom access, which is great, uh, so we can roll this activity that starts today and go through all the, uh, through September, uh, every Thursday night at the same time. So Aldo and the Weed, uh, Brazilian Weed Society, thank you so much for that. We also have uh, uh, Dr. Luis Avila, who we, was the, the person that uh, visioned that last year, idealized this activity and uh, helped that uh, it, it go through the first international webinar series. And also he's, he helped uh, the, the committee organizing uh, with the second edition. So. Uh, with that being said, uh, and also with some uh, reminds, folks, uh, at, at the end of each speech, we're going to have the, uh, the possibility to answer questions. So you, you may do that. so in the Q&A section. Please uh, uh, go ahead and put your questions there so we'll be able to, to answer at, at the end of each speak. Uh, and also for those who be participating for out of four out of five activities that we'll have, we'll be able to provide a certificate of participation. So that's an, another important information that I would like to mention. With that being said, I will be presenting the first speaker, Dr. Frank Dayan. Dr. Frank Dayan was born in Lyon, France, and he grew up in the south of France. He attended the Institute Agricole of Fontelain, and you can help me say that better in French later, Frank, where he developed appreciation for plant science and agriculture. He received his PhD in plant physiology from Albert University in Alabama in 1995. And he worked as a research plant physiology from USDA, ARIS, Natural Product Utilization Research Unit for 20 years. He is now a professor in the Department of Agricultural Biology at Colorado State University. His work covers the mechanisms of action of natural and synthetic herbicides and the mechanisms of herbicide resistance in plants, as well as, as chemical ecological studies of plant-plant interaction, a little pet. He's active, uh, he's active in the scientific, scientific societies and serves uh, on editorial boards of several journals. So, um, Dr. Frank Dayan, uh, with that, we turn to, to you and I uh, appreciate very much that you accept our invitation. Well, thank you so much, Edinovo, for this great introduction. And uh, I guess these slides uh, shows that there's a lot of support toward uh, this webinar series. And so I wanna thank also uh, these people that are contributing to this seminar series. So the first talk, I guess, in the series will be a little bit different because it's not going to be very uh, on a very technical subject, but uh, uh, we'll be talking about uh, training the next generation of weed management scientists. Uh, and that is something that I've been thinking a lot about because uh, there, there has been a way of training weed scientists. That has been the traditional way. Typically, people have agronomy background and they have some experience in the field and maybe they take some graduate level classes, get a master's or a PhD and maybe specialize in some of the more advanced technologies. Uh, but as we at Colorado State University were developing a new undergraduate degree in agricultural biology, we spent quite a bit of time thinking about what is the current situation for uh, people that come out of degrees uh, uh, for, with a degree in, uh, in uh, weed science, for example, uh, what uh, jobs are available, what do companies want, 
and then maybe uh, what could we do better to train our students to be equipped for professional life so again it, you know we're not going to be talking about mode of actions and resistance it's going to be really more of an overview of uh, how uh, the job market is uh, in, and how we train our students for that job market and so they'll be very simple there's only i think 27 slides so i'm hoping to speak pretty slowly there's going to be three main topics which are these we're going to look at the current and future employment prospects in wheat science and actually i should say that this applies to general pest management uh you know entomology and plant uh, uh, plant pathology would kind of fall under the same uh umbrella uh and then we'll have a another section about the status of the ag industry uh and then a little bit about what industry is looking for okay so let's start with the first topic the current and future employment prospects so as we know uh the number of people involved in directly in agriculture or agriculture related uh jobs changes as a country goes from a, a developing status to more advances for example in a developing countries about up to 75 percent of the people so but you know we're over here 20 2021 20, so i'll say maybe 70 percent of the population in these countries are involved in jobs related to related to agriculture either production but also uh distribution uh packaging and all of these aspects of agriculture uh in uh as the countries become more advanced in the economy those levels go down. So right now we're probably at 30% in the middle income countries. And then in developed countries, it's probably less than 5%. So it's a small segment of the population. Okay, so then we have to ask ourselves, are we training people to work in this field? So how can we best prepare them to uh, get those, to be qualified for those jobs that will be available? And obviously, the type of agriculture that's done in developing countries is a little bit different from developed countries. So then the qualifications, the skills required will be different. So this is a slide that represents the percent uh, jobs uh, that are forecast. So in the next several years, the percent of jobs and where the jobs are. So this, again, uh, is very similar to what we're seeing. Agriculture is way down there. It's pretty small, right? Uh, academia is also something that we need to be uh, maybe uh, talking about because people that uh, come up with graduate degrees may do research in uh, agriculture and in wheat science within the academic field. Of course, people can be directly involved in agriculture, go back to the farm, come to school, be trained, and then go back to the family farm or become a farm manager. Uh, but then, of course, there's more jobs, for example, in the biotech and genomics area in the future. That's, this is where those jobs are going to be. So then the question we want to ask ourselves is, are the way we train our students right now, or is the way we are training our students right now, opening doors in the biotech and genomic areas that are related to agriculture? So of course, this is in the US. I'm, I don't know in Brazil and around the world. This data reflects the US, by the way. But I'm assuming it's very similar around developed countries. Of course, the federal labs, like I was a federal employee for 20 years working in agriculture. So there's a, a lot of jobs available. And in, in my particular case, I was a lab, I had my own lab. So not only uh, there was a job for a research leader, but I had a couple of technicians that had master's or bachelor's degree, and then student workers, okay? So that opens a lot of opportunities. Uh, there's also a lot of opportunities in R&D, research and development. So now this part right here includes, you know, all kinds of R&D, not only agriculture, but definitely there's a lot of job opportunities in chemical companies involved in R&D of agricultural related uh, work. Uh, other governmental work like EPA, 
in the US, we have the Environmental Protection Agency. Some of our students that are trained in wheat science get jobs at EPA or maybe at the state level working for uh, various uh, ag-related uh, uh, groups within the state. Uh, and then, uh, you know, this big bar, which is the materials and chemicals, uh, that's all chemicals. So, of course, the ag chem industry will be a smaller part of this, but there are quite a bit of jobs available in, in the ag chem industry. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So something that's important to think when we train our students is, you know, where are those jobs going to be? And in the U.S., some of the jobs, uh, especially those in food production, you know, within the next five years, I believe, uh, let me make sure that I'm not missing this. Yeah, I think so. Within the next five years, 40%, more than 40% of the workforce will be retiring. Okay. Uh, same thing with some of the government places and in the uh, chemical industry. You know, up, you know, 30% of the people are going to be retiring globally in the chemical industry. So there'll be a lot of jobs available in these areas. Uh, and then this is a profile of the next five years where the, the most likely graduate uh, people with graduate uh, college degrees will find jobs. And I don't know exactly what happened here. <laughs> uh, the data said none. I'm sure that's not true. There'll be jobs over here. But, you know, there'll be, uh, you know, 25% of the jobs in the food production area and I don't know, 30% in the chemical industry area. As a matter of fact, I was talking to somebody at Corteva that's uh, in the uh, herbicide discovery uh, group. So it's so, you know, not Corteva globally, but really in the herbicide part of Corteva. And what uh, he, that person was telling me is that in Europe, nearly 100% of their staff will be retiring in the next five years. And these jobs will be replaced. And then in the US, about 30 to 40% of these uh, current Corteva employees will be retiring. OK, so that kind of matches what we're talking about here. The chemical industry uh, as a whole was 30 to 40 percent. Corteva completely agrees with this data. So this is like overall overall industry and all jobs in the U.S. Uh, but again, talking to people in chemical companies, that supports the fact that they're going to have a big turnover of uh, jobs. So again, that's encouraging for our grad students and uh, maybe even undergraduate that may work as technicians, that those jobs are gonna be there within certain fields, but they're gonna have to be trained a particular way to, uh, to fulfill those positions that will be becoming opening uh, in, in these fields. So kind of an overview, you know, of uh, current and the future employments uh, in the in the weed science area, so to speak. So let's talk about the ag chem industry status. And uh, as I'm giving this presentation, I realized I should have put another slide because I just wrote a review um, early in the year, like in February, on the impact of COVID on the ag chem industry and especially the, the, the herbicide industry. If you're interested, to receive this review. It was published in Outlooks on Pest Management. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of interesting information about the impact of COVID because COVID will have changed the way industry is gonna move forward in the way they do work. So first, uh, one of the big issues, of course, that uh, we are all aware of is that there has been a great consolidation in the agrochemical industry. So. I'm just showing the example of Bayer, but this will be true for all of the major five or six players around the world, right? So Bayer was funded in 1863, so it's been around for a long time. Uh, and the Bayer that we've known for the longest, you know, since 2000 was basically Bayer and Aventis coming together to create Bayer crop science. Now, of course, Aventis and Bayer uh, Aventis was actually uh, created in 1999 by the uh, merging of Agrivo and Ron Poulenc. And then if you go back, Ron Poulenc then was a conglomerate of several companies and Agrivo was actually even worse. A lot of different companies had been absorbed into Agrivo. And of course, in 2000, uh, uh, 
So in 2000, Monsanto was created when uh, uh, it uh, joined with Pharmacia, the Monsanto uh, crop science part of it. And then in 2018, Bayer purchased Monsanto. So now we have one company called Bayer Crop Science that essentially has uh, uh, absorbed the diversity, the different approaches of all these companies, right? So in the end, there are actually fewer jobs in Bayer Crop Science than there were when you had all of these other companies, especially in the herbicide discovery group, because each of these companies had their own herbicide discovery group. And whenever you have that, you have to have people to do all the, you know, the registration, all the field testing and everything. And now all of that has been condensed into one company called Bayer Crop Science. Now that's the same for Syngenta, for BASF, uh, for, you know, to some extent, FMC, uh, maybe uh, Vela Sumitomo, you know, they have been purchasing all the smaller companies to become uh, major players in the field. So that's one limitation is that uh, there are fewer companies that have jobs related to this type of work. And then, of course, there's been an issue with increased cost of R&D. Uh, so that has slowed down some of the work from companies because what used to take 150 million in 1995, not 260, uh, 286 million. Uh, you know, this is actually almost 10 years old now. And uh, I'm waiting for the new data to come from this uh, Philip McDougall group because we, I don't have that data. Uh, available. I'm sure they have it, but it costs a lot of money to get that information. So now, uh, the good thing is then there are people involved in registration. So people with weed science background can be, become expert in regist re registration of chemicals. People can be involved in environmental chemical, uh, environmental uh, chemistry, toxicology, field trials, chemistry, tox and environmental uh, uh, toxicology, in the biology and the chemistry. So then uh, in a in sense, it takes more money to get the, the products through, but of course that requires more people. So there will be jobs in all of these fields. And again, always we have to ask ourselves when we train our students in weed science, which of these jobs can they compete for, right? Because in the end, we train our students to become professional, uh, you know, in, in for the rest of their lives. So we want to keep in mind that are we only focusing in field trials? There's only so much need for this, but all of these are job opportunities for our students. Uh, something I was going to mention is, of course, some of the issues with uh, pesticides. Generally speaking, uh, this uh, slide that I put together is really focused on herbicides. Uh, of course, we know that Monsanto was sued, you know, uh, for the glyphosate causing cancer and actually Bayer who purchased Monsanto settled, I believe for $6 billion last year in the US. So that lawsuit goes nowhere. You know, there are people complaining about atrazine causing uh, problems in frogs because a lot of people have issues with GMOs. Uh, the introduction of uh, auxinic herbicides uh, this slide, I think, is from 2018, where there was so many reports of injury because of drift of dicamba, mostly a little bit from 2,4-D. Uh, and of course, the classic case of Imprelis that basically shut down all of the ag chem research in DuPont, and they basically sold off because of that one lawsuit. So uh, again, uh, as a person training the field, I do some consulting for lawsuits for companies. You, if your students want to make a lot of money, they should be trained in weed science, understand chemistry, and get a law degree. And then they can make a lot of work, a lot of work and a lot of money doing that. But of course, when we train our students in weed science, we don't think they're going to become lawyers, but why not, right? There are people in, in those fields that have those backgrounds that become lawyers and they are very, very rich people. Okay, now one thing that's with us and it's not gonna go away is that crop yield are affected by pests. 
And that's a good thing for us in some ways. It's a bane of agriculture, but it's good because as long as we have problems, we can train students to address these problems. So these are the trends of increasing yields through mostly breeding um, in maize, rice, wheat, and soybean. These are the projected needs for 2050. So the solid line is what, if it continues on the same trend, this is where we're gonna be. For maize, we need to be over here. For rice, we need to be over here rather than here. And same thing for wheat and soybean. So we need to not only through uh, germplasm improvement have higher yields, but we need to continue to increase and exceed that trend. And of course, uh, the climate affects this, soil quality affects this, and pests affect this. Now, while we can do something about climate change as citizens of the world, we scientists as a whole cannot do much about climate, uh, climate change. You know, we scientists can affect uh, soil health by, you know, providing new integrated pest management ways of uh, uh, doing things so that the soil is preserved. And of course, we, our students can help with pest management. So, you know, our students can play a key role in achieving some of these goals. So that's encouraging as well. That those, those jobs are going to be there because we need to have food. And then, of course, when we look at weeds, uh, so when we look at pests, generally speaking, uh, uh, you know, weeds have the biggest potential loss. The, the weeds can cause the most, the greatest potential loss. So good weed management by percentage is, can be the biggest contributor to exceed these trends. So again, that's good for our students, but for plant pathologists and entomologists too, it's a good sign. You know, these students are most likely gonna have jobs because of that. All right, so let me see how my time is 4.23. So now we're gonna spend the rest of the lecture on what industry is looking for. So I'm hoping, you know, that if you have questions on the first two sections, that either you put them uh, in the chat box or oh, I believe maybe that, uh, I don't know exactly how this Zoom meeting is set up, uh, but I believe Dinalvo has maybe access to questions that people may pose. Uh, so as you come up with questions, go ahead and send them so we, you don't forget. And then we'll have plenty of time to, uh, to have a discussion about this. So what is industry looking for? Okay. What is, do you have a question? Are we good? No, perfect. Your okay. comment, uh, they can place que questions in the Q&A question uh, okay. that's on the bottom of the platform. So that's the place to go. Okay, very good. All right, so what is industry, industry looking for? And again, this data that I'm showing here is from the US, but I, I'm assuming that it will be very similar to uh, most uh, you know, developed countries, and even a, a country like Brazil would be very similar. Okay. So the job, jobs have changed. And so this is an industry, not the ag industry specifically, but industry more globally, right? And historically, uh, there was a lot of jobs that required routine tasks where uh, so, somebody would be, have a college degree or a graduate degree, get a job with a company, whatever it was. So let's say it's, you know, uh, uh, it could be ag industry, but this graph reflects industry as a whole. There was a lot of tasks that were uh, required routine over the over time, and it's you know stabilizing now. Uh, the jobs in industry require less and less routine tasks, and so they have more, of course, non-routine tasks. But what's really interesting is they have a lot of tasks that require social skills. Okay, so I think historically we've done a great job training our students with technical skills that enables them to do routine tasks because they know how to do something. But more and more companies require employees that have, you know, uh, jobs that require social skills, right? And most, if I, if I look around the US, most programs in wheat science 
or pest management sciences, they they'll focus on technical skills, but not so much on social skills. So that's something that we need to think about. Okay, with the way we do our classes, are, are there ways to include you know group projects? And I'm sure most of you do that because of this. You know, um, those students need to be able to have those social skills to communicate effectively and to lead groups effectively. Uh, that's also a survey across the industry of what uh, you know industry is looking for. And so what's interesting is that students you know worry so much about the college reputation, the reputation of the school they attend. You know, in the US people want to go to you know Harvard and MIT and Yale and things like this. But if you are in we in in the in the ag science, you know, uh, of course, big schools like Cornell, UC Davis, uh, Wisconsin, Ohio State, you know, these will be the bigger schools, Illinois will be the bigger schools. But in fact, that is not a huge deal for industry where people get their degrees. And even the GPA, you know, of course, you have to have a good GPA. We don't want our students to not have good GPAs, uh, but of course, but that is not really what's so important about it um, for industry. You know, they want to make sure that you have the relevant coursework, meaning did you learn the skills for your degree? But they are looking for people that have extracurricular activities. They're not looking for cogs in the machine. They want people that have personalities, that have life experience. They are very interested in people that have volunteer experience. And I think because that says something about the personality of a person, someone that can go to school, take the classes, you know, do well, but then is uh, has a social consciousness of being involved with volunteer work, and it could be work volunteering at a at a organic farm that needs people to help. It could be volunteering in clubs and you know other things. But volunteering work is actually something that industry will be looking for on a resume. And so, because, you know, when I think of a resume, I think what classes I had, what, is, what skills I have, but in fact, uh, they are those soft skills, you know, volunteering is actually something that they look for. Of course, the college major is important. If they're looking for a wheat scientist, they want somebody with a wheat science background, entomology background, whatever the, the job that you're applying for. Employment during college is huge and internship, these two things. And so this is super important. And that is one thing that's really great about Brazil that has a sandwich requirement because that really provides this piece of the puzzle. In the US, you know, we do that, uh, but it's maybe not as intentional as in, the, as in Brazil. So that kudos for Brazil for the sandwich program because not only most of these students go over abroad, so not only they get the internship and the employment experience, but they actually learn a new language and a new culture. And so that's huge. Uh, and basically the, the, the reason why the order is like this is because when I talk to industry, uh, friends you know that have like big jobs in industry they assume that you've been trained correctly typically for grad students they'll go to conferences and they'll see students that are good speakers people that do good research and so they kind of uh, scout for good students so this is why it's important for our students to attend these meetings of course but they also assume that they will train their employee to do the jobs that they need to do Right, so this is why they're looking for these other skills because they they assume that people have the background. We can train them to do what they need to do, but do they have these other, you know, skills? This is a really interesting set of data, and that's again that's in the U.S. I just don't know how it is in Brazil, but I was I would be surprised if it's different. So people have done a survey of. Uh, job description in industry. And they looked at the frequency of what was written in the job description. They wanted, you know, people have the skills to do written communication that can solve problems, that can coordinate groups, can give presentations, can communicate data. Do they have leadership skills? 
operations is more like uh, on the, uh, you know, how you manage projects. Can you, but then can you manage people and then can you do research? So these are the frequency of how often these keywords are mentioned in job descriptions. And then the same study looked out what people applying for these jobs put in their resumes. And of course, they, you know, you know, they focus on the top, you know, they say, yeah, we can do research and we could manage people. But all of these other things that actually industry people want to know about you, very few people actually mention that in their resumes. So I think we can do a better job at training our students in how to write a resume and how to, how to read a job description and make sure that everything that's in the job description is addressed on the resume. This, I did not know this. This was shocking to me. Uh, I always assumed that people looked at the, re, the, the job description and then every time they apply for a job, they actually change the resume to match what's being asked on the job description. But apparently a lot of people don't do that. They have the resume and then they'll apply to different jobs with the same resumes and I encourage our students at CSU not to do that. Look at the job description and carefully uh, go through and address every point that they're looking for. Again, uh, uh, there were surveys done with industry about skills that were lacking. So in plant science, so this is not only weed science, it's plant science, generally speaking. But industry people would say, you know, we, we're having people that are not ready for work or they don't have a work ethics. They don't always have the technical skills. They don't know the, 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 the content of the background information. They don't have quantitative, oops, sorry, back up, quantitative skills. They don't have communication skills. So again, you have all these big things and then they're looking for these other things, experience, interpersonal skills, personal attributes. So when we train our students, we need to think of them as whole beings and not just with scientists, but try to address all of these aspects. One thing I want to say so far, I've had, I don't know, so many Brazilian students in my lab, and you all do a very good job with work readiness and work ethics and technical skills. Students that I get from Brazil are very well prepared to work in my lab. So again, I want to really emphasize that. So then these are like in reverse order. Top uh, skills would be technical skills. Of course, you're playing for a job in a technical field. Uh, they expect you to have it. So on your resume, make sure that you mention you have those technical skills. They want to make sure that people can work in teams. Most industry jobs and most new jobs require to work in teams. So they don't want people that cannot work in teams. They don't want people that cannot listen to constructive criticism, people ca that cannot change the way they are or the way they change an idea, people that are set in their ways. That's a big uh, negative aspect that industry people will say, well, I'm not gonna have this per hire this person because that person is not ready to work in a team. Interpersonal, interpersonal skills, you know, listening skills, communication skills, verbal and nonverbal communication skills, problem solving, self-controlling confidence, time management. You know, these are important. And we need to tell our students, these are important things when you apply for a job. Uh, leadership skills is huge. So the more we can train our students to lead projects, uh, the better it is for them. Again, this is kind of repeating from another one, but communication skills is very important. Uh, Paul Mayer says communication is the human connection, is the key to personal and career success. So if, you, if we can teach our students how to convey ideas, convey uh, data, uh, they'll be more successful in their career. And sometimes nonverbal communication skills are very important. It is said that we form an opinion on somebody within the first five seconds. So, you know, we need to be aware of that. And then, of course, critical thinking skills. That's what industry is looking for. People that can work in a team and look at a problem, come up, you know, be creative, analyze data, communicate the data, maybe revise the hypothesis, be open-minded to maybe change direction, 
and then be creative, come up with new solutions to solve the problem. This is something that really is difficult to achieve uh, in our student because it's such a complex thing. But being aware that we need to do that, I think is important as we teach our courses. Again, I think that's maybe the last slide. Uh, where are going to be the jobs in the future? The, the, these are the most important technologies, I think, in the next five years. Big data, you know, do we have, do we train our students to at least have some exposure in bioinformatics? That's huge. You know, AI, machine learning, we don't teach our students to do that, but there's going to be so many jobs with robotics, with, uh, you know, Internet of Things, everything that's computer based digital work for weed science is huge. If we could develop di digital ways of mapping weeds to complement, you know, uh, uh, computerized sprayers so we can reduce the output of pesticides to protect the environment, you know. Robotics, of course, is gonna be huge in agriculture. Genomics, proteomics, synthetic biology, systems biology. You know, all of these jobs require very well trained students and we want to make sure that as we move forward we take that into account in our degree planning of what classes our students are going to take right so with that i'm going to stop it's uh 4 37 i had until 4 40 so i think i did a good job thanks to myself and at this point i'm going to uh come out of this uh Edinaldo, Edinaldo, should I come out of the slides or should I keep the slides up to go back to the slides if somebody asks for it? Yeah, if you can place the first one, the, the first one. Oh. This yeah. one? Yes, great. Uh, very good. Thank you, Frank, for, for your presentation and for keep up on uh, applaud for you, as you said, for, for stay on time. Uh, as, as people are coming up with questions, I want, I want to make one question for you uh, that's on the, the topic of uh, being able to present yourself, the resume. If you have to give uh, clues or uh, ideas for people, we have a lot of students in the audience, what they should do to prepare a good resume, what would you say? Okay, so actually before I go into the resume, since there are students in there, uh, because of time, I made this presentation a bit shorter. I have a couple of slides on networking. Mm -hmm. Because your resume is a piece of paper. And when you apply for a job, some jobs, there may be 100 people applying for the same job. So that's really difficult to come out out of the list of 100 resumes on a piece of paper. I think the work becomes be, uh, the, the work begins before that with networking. And so I'll just give you my example. Uh, I was doing my PhD on uh, sulfentrazone, uh, which was a new PPO inhibiting herbicides in you know 1992 when I started. And uh, I would go to the wheat science meeting to present my 15 minute you know, presentation. Of course, as a student, you, lead the, you read the literature and it became very obvious that, that Dr. Stephen Duke was an expert in PPO herbicides in the US. At that time, Dr. Duke was president of the WSSA. And I was a nobody graduate student going to my first weed science meeting. I don't know anybody except a few people from my department. Well, I went and introduced myself to Dr. Duke and I was so nervous because I think, you know, he was like, you know, uh, I, I don't want to say a God, but like a, such a famous scientist, but I introduced myself and he turned out to be very nice. And what you will find graduate students is most scientists are actually very nice people. And so when I introduced myself, he was president of the WSSA and he was talking to Mike Barrett and David Shaw, all of the big, you know, weed scientists. And I was like so nervous and I introduced myself and I said, Dr. Duke, uh, uh, my name is Frank Dion. I go to school, blah, blah, blah. You know, I introduced myself and I said, I'm doing a research on sulfentrazone. 
uh, and it's and it's mode of action. And I give my talk on Wednesday at two p.m. and I would love for you to come hear my talk. And I left, and he came to my presentation. And I think that if you do that, people will they will not come necessarily if you don't introduce yourself because there's so many other interesting talks. But if you introduce yourself, you increase your chances by fifteen percent that they will come. And I did that every year for three years. At the that the last meeting, I went into uh, introduce myself again, and I said, "Dr. Du, um, I will be graduating, and I would love to, you know, if, to work with you if there was a job opportunity." And he told me, "You know, I don't have a grant at the moment, but I'll keep that in mind." So that was in February because the WSSA meeting is always in February. Um, and in March, I got a letter because, of course, email was not so big. In 1992, I got a letter from Dr. Duke saying in March, I got a grant. Why don't you apply for this job? I think you'll be great. Now, there were like 100 people applying for the job. If I had not met him for three years in a row and I had just applied for the job, I would have been just as qualified as because I had the same classes and everything, but I, have been, I would have been one unknown name in the stack of 100 applicants. Uh, and because I had that personal connection, I'm 100% convinced that that made a change. And so I then ended up with a postdoc with Steve Duke, and then I worked with him for 20 years, right? So networking for me changed my life, and it can change yours, right? Grad students is super important. So next time you go to a meeting, do not be afraid to introduce yourself that you think is like a big fish, right? Go ahead and introduce yourself. And this is where you have to have those five minute presentation. You want to, you don't want to speak for 30 minutes. You want to be able to say in five minutes who you are, what you work with, what you are interested in, and the kind of jobs you're looking for kind of thing, right? So now uh, that answers maybe, because that's, uh, to me, that's even more important, more important than the resume is networking. Now the resume is important because every job description will be different. And so, on a resume, of course, you want to talk about the, you know, the classes you've had, uh, the grades you had, maybe a bit of the research that you had, but you can customize that to address every point that's mentioned in a, re in a job description. So not, there's not one resume for all your job applications. Every job application will require a slightly different resume that you can personalize because people that read the resumes, they go through, if you have a hundred to go through, they're gonna go very quickly. And if it looks like if or the person did not even look at the job description, you're not gonna have a chance. That's gonna be in the non-interesting pile. But if you, if you can show that you paid attention to what they're looking for, then you're gonna start ticking all the key words that they're looking for. And so it's okay to use the words that use, they use on the job description. If they say you need to have these skills, make sure you mention that skill in the job description. Of course, as long as you have it, be honest, but make sure that it's very specific. That's basically, you know, all I want to say because, you know, you can, I'm sure every university probably gives seminars on how to write a resume. And these people probably can do a better job, generally speaking. But I think in the field of weed science, you want to address very specifically all the points that I mentioned in, on the job description. Fantastic. I think uh, Zobioli made, made a comment that goes along on the, in the chat that uh, to complement what you were saying. We have some questions coming up, so let's try to get to them. Okay. Uh, the first one comes from Vivian, uh, Vivian Vienna. She's a, a, a postdoc in our, in our research team. She asked about uh, a question regarding people that are have, they have grad grad school, I mean, master and PhD. Uh, she commented that it's becoming more and more difficult to find jobs due to that specialization. Sometimes PhD is not understood as as an experience. What do you, what do you think about that? Uh, not understood as a work experience, professional yeah. experience. Yeah, yeah. So you know that's uh, that's a tough thing. Um, um, one thing I said to everyone that wants to do grad school in my, uh, in my group is, you know, what job do you want to have? Because if your job 
requires a master's, the job that you want to have requires a master's, then don't do a PhD because then you will be overqualified. If you want to manage your own lab or be responsible for research projects like in industry, for example, then you need to have a PhD. So first, you know, you have to know what you what kind of job interests you, and then you seek the degree that you want. Uh, now, specifically to answer Viviana, Viviana's question. Yeah. Uh, Vivian. Yeah, Vivian. One thing that uh, we try to do in our group is to offer the opportunity for students to do internships with industry. So that we have our grad students, you know, they get funded by different chemical companies. And so, you know, chemical companies are have invested money into the project. So very toward the end, middle to the end of the PhD, for example, we try to really find a situation where that student can go work with the industry for like at least two weeks, maybe a month. And that then makes a difference because uh, again, you have that personal connection with that particular industry. And that again, opens a lot of doors because if you're very qualified and they can see, let's say they put you on a, on a project that's not directly related to your research. And they can see that you can adapt and be productive and be helpful in their team's environment to uh, work on a project that may be not directly related to your research. That's what well, that person is trained for this, but they can also do this. So you know, that's what I would say is really try to get those opportunities to do internships with industry. Um, that may open doors more so than just the PhD. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, another question from Diana Zabala. She's also a great student in our, our team. The future scenario for wheat science and even agronomics demand numerous skills. Do you consider that wheat science programs in universities should or are they modifying the training of the students along the same lines? I guess yes. like it, goes, it goes along with your last slide where yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you are expected to have a lot of new skills and how can we i'm sorry this slide right here yeah yeah so you know that's that's a good question so i think this you know i think would be university specific you know uh most of the students that come for example in, in our group working with you know scott nason todd Gaines, or myself will do mostly lab work and they'll be trained you know in analytical skills um, molecular skills uh, and then most of the projects will have a big data aspect either metabolomics or transcriptomics so all of our grad students take you know python programming and they all take uh bioinformatics to cover kind of this right here one thing that we, we're not training our students in robotics, for example, or AI or machine learning. But I think if I had a student that uh, had a project that related to that, I definitely would do that, right? But again, then if you go down the list, systems biology is down the list, but that is huge because uh, I think that relates to Vivian's, uh, oh no, that's Diana's comment, or maybe even Vivian, that we, 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 we become hyper-specialized and I know the way I was trained, it was classical, you know, uh, biology, which is you have a problem, you try to break it down to simple, you test A to try to find the answer B, very linear relationship. But of course, in any sciences, now we know that it's a lot more complicated. Uh, things are part of a system. So that, you know, if you start putting Dakemba, then you're going to have drift problems or you're going to have wheat shifts, you know, the biology, the ecology of the field will change, the way the chemistry function is different. So I think thinking not in terms of simple A to B relationship, but think in terms of uh, systems biology really helps also land those jobs, because when you do the interview, uh, you come across speaking at, at a systems level rather than just a simple problem. And that really shows uh, critical thinking skills that can put different facts together to come up with a complex answer rather than a simple answer. And I, I, I have to confess, I was trained 
to always try to break down a complex problem to simple problems to solve them. But I think we need to train our new students to step back and be, you know, uh, uh, systemic th system thinking, system thinkers. And so we, we, I have a book that I go with through my students called System Thinking that kind of focuses on biology to help them think in those terms. Is there another question? Oh, hopefully, oh, yeah. is there a follow-up question on that? Yes. Uh, yes, we still have uh, minutes so we can, can take another question. Uh, there is a question here from Ajani. He, he thanks your presentation. From the statistics, you provide about 100% labor force retiring in the next five years in Europe. Uh, in the so for, in, US, in Corteva. In Corteva. In Corteva. That was okay. I was talking. I was talking to somebody at Corteva about okay. this because as I was putting this talk, and he he told me nearly 100% of Corteva Europe will be retiring. Okay. In the U.S., about 30 to 40 percent. All right. I think the, the question goes on those lines. If he knows if that matches with the with other countries around the world, probably you don't have that number. I do not know that. You know, that's the thing is, uh, you know, there's only so many times in the day. I'm really interested in this. I, I just had I was on the phone with that person with Coltera. So I asked him the question. That's how I found out. I, you know, I, I probably should take the time to ask. You know, people from, you know, I guess we have contacted Bayer, we have contacted BSF, and uh, maybe I could come up and maybe when I write the paper, if I publish a paper on this, I'll have, you know, new data and, and up to date information on that from around the world. That, that would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another question. I'm an agronomy student. How is the opportunities from Brazilian agronomists at companies in the US? Uh, you know, I don't know as agronomists, I cannot say. What I can tell you is people that we train, right? So for example, my first graduate student, Hudson Takano, came, you know, from uh, uh, Brazil, uh, did his PhD with me and landed one of the prime research job at Corteva in the Herbicide Discovery Group. We had a student from uh, Costa Rica that got a job in Herbicide Discovery at Corteva. Uh, let me think, we, uh, we had another student from Brazil, Marcelo Figueiredo, that got a postdoc at Duke University. So I think, I think Hudson had an agronomy background and I think uh, Marcelo had an agronomy background. Now they didn't have a PhD in agronomy that an undergraduate in, uh, in agronomy and then got an advanced degree in wheat science. But in these two examples in, in my lab, these people got really, really great job in US companies. Uh, uh, let me think who else is coming out recently from South America. I think these are the two main examples that I can think of, or three main examples that I can think of. Did that answer? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, I, I guess says, uh, Luis, Luis says Jessica from Professor Camila was hired by FMC recently in the chat. So there are opportunities, but you have to be a top, a top student. You uh -huh. have to publish, you have to, and all these have great communi communication skills. If you know Hudson, Hudson is just like a great speaker, can explain things very well and a great scientist. So it's not for everybody, but people that work really hard have really great chances. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so last question we will take. Uh, Johan Murcia asked uh, here in the chat, did you think that graduate school, school uh, really promotes the creativity? You know, that's, that's a really, really good question because creativity is more of a personality trait, right? I, you know, soft and, skill. right? It's a soft skill. Now, for me, I've always be more on the creative things. Uh, you know, I play all kinds of musical instruments and I draw. So the art has always interested me, right? So a lot of my work is very creative. And so the way I train my students is to be creative so that when they first come in my program, for example, I'll tell them, okay, we, this is what we need to do. And let's start with this. By the time they finish their PhD, my goal is for them to tell me, I think we need to do this. I thought about this. I think we need to do that. I want them to show that they are coming up with ideas and being creative. Now, that's the way I do my program. I, I cannot say across the board if everybody 
has that. But to me, because creativity is such an essential part to come up with new ideas, that's the way I train my students to be creative. They come, I first tell them what to do, and then I want them, and I tell them, you know, now I want you to come up with experiments and we go through and very often the first few experiments are like very kind of crazy sounding, but then as, as they learn um, how to set up and come up with ideas in the end, they're basically coming up with, with their own research experiments. Very good. Uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so Fred, much the, the, for, for your time and uh, for accepting our invitation. And I think uh, a lot of people will be thinking about what we just discussed here and maybe as an opportunity to, to line up some of the your career, early career, or even people that are uh, good ways along their career. Very good. Well, thank you so much for the invitation.